I'll start uh, with a few general observations and then move on to talk about the specific study that we have done and what its implications might be. Um, I think there's no doubt that hospitals um, hold a, a changing place uh, in the culture of our society. Um, hospitals, of course, have very important historical roots, and we know of the existence of hospitals going back to early medieval times. And words like hospital, um, hospitality, hotel, and indeed hospice all come from similar roots and are associated with the notion of resting places for travelers and pilgrims and the sick and the indigent. Um, but over time, um, perhaps in the modern era, uh, the image of the hospital has become um, something a little bit removed from that. We think of it more and more as a, a modern high-tech environment where a lot of interventions are going on uh, and whereas we'll hear people are moving in and out of the hospital environment uh, rather quickly. So there's an interesting kind of history to think about when framing our discussion today about what a hospital is and what it's for uh, and how the versions of hospitals that we have today uh, may or may not meet our needs and what they might look like uh, in the future. Um, within that context, what, one thing that has become very clear is that in modern times, and by that I mean the last 100 years or so, uh, hospitals have become uh, very common places in which we die. Um, we can see from the middle of the 19th century through to the present day uh, a gradual trend towards uh, um, dying in institutions of various kinds, but particularly hospitals, uh, and a move away from uh, dying at home. There's a little bit of evidence to suggest that that trend might be changing, or at least bottoming out. The, the steady fall in home deaths um, has been reported to be stopping uh, in some contexts uh, in England and in Canada. In a way, we would have expected this to happen given the very heavy emphasis we placed on care in the community in recent decades. And now we're beginning to see some evidence that that fall in rates of home death, which has been underway for many decades, may be slowing up. But we haven't got the evidence uh, for Scotland yet. Of course, there is a lot of concern about uh, the hospital as a place to die. Um, we know, for example, in England, there's been a lot of debate about um, the poor quality of care at the end of life, as evidenced in uh, reports from the Care Quality Commission, in some of the debates that surfaced around the Liverpool care pathway uh, as well. So the, there is kind of an issue about um, what are we doing in hospital when we're looking after people at the very end of life. So there's a, a very interesting history. There's uh, the changing perception of the hospital. There's the growing role of the hospital as a place where we die. And there's also issues about how we can better care for people uh, in that context. But I think there's also kind of parallel uh, set of discourse around hospitals uh, seen in a rather different way. I was kind of reading a little bit about this in preparation for today, the notion of hospitals as places of transformation and change. Um, there, are, there are ideas like health promoting hospitals. There's the idea of the hospital without pain. Um, there's something called the value-based hospital. Uh, and the one I know best, because I did quite a bit of work trying to understand it, is the idea of the hospice-friendly hospital. This was a program which was developed in Ireland over the last 15 years or so and is still running, and which has attempted to uh, bring some of the wider values that we might associate with hospice care into the mainstream uh, of hospital uh, care organisation uh, and indeed design and, and uh, construction. So hospitals are not static, they are changing places, the, our vision of the hospital is changing. And I think for me the context today is one about the hospital as a place where we can identify and reach out to those who are nearing the end of life. I, I think one of the big messages from the study that we did is that um, it, it demonstrates very strongly that uh, the, ho uh, the hospital is a place that we should give attention to when thinking about the identification of people who might have uh, palliative and end-of-life care needs, a possible point of entry uh, to uh, that process. Now, today isn't really about dying in hospital, but I did want to say a little bit about that. Um, 
As many of you will know, uh, hospitals are a place where we, many of us die. 58% of all deaths in Scotland, 54% in England. Though paradoxically, studies show that most of us don't want to die in hospital. Most of us like to die at home. Uh, so there's this kind of uh, paradox between where we want to die and where most of us will die. Uh, but when you look around the world, the, these trends vary quite a bit. In a country like Albania, only 11% of people uh, die in hospital, whereas in Japan, I think uh, they're, they're at the top of the hospital death uh, uh, league table. 78% of, uh, of uh, Japanese people will die in hospital. Um, I saw a study published a few years ago that looked at um, home and hospital deaths in um, the south of Italy. And it found that in uh, Calabria and those areas, uh, almost no one died in a hospital. And the immediate interpretation was, oh, this is very good. Um, you know, people are dying at home where they should be and where they want to be. But in fact, when they dug deeper into that uh, work, they, they found that the care that people received at home in, in very poor uh, region of, uh, of Italy was uh, far from adequate. And really, the fact that they were all dying at home was because they had very poor access to care in the hospital. So we need to um, look at these kind of figures um, with uh, caution when we, we look at these headline figures of where people die and uh, particularly rates of death in the hospital. And we need to perhaps assess the role of and influence of the different healthcare systems and the levels of resources that are available uh, to people that might be influencing uh, this ch these changing patterns that we're seeing uh, about uh, place of death and particularly hospital death. Um, as I said, there's been a lot of issues, about negative issues, about uh, the care of people at the end of life in hospital. But it was interesting uh, a couple of weeks ago to see in the BMJ somebody who had a go at unpacking the kind of bit of clinical law which suggests that death at home is always a good thing to aim for. And there was, uh, I don't know if people saw that uh, review article. It's not very often that uh, social scientists get to publish their work in the BMJ, so I, I looked at it with some interest. But it, it was really saying, look, we, we, we shouldn't be too um, um, uncritical in our thinking about uh, home death as, as a good outcome of, uh, to uh, care at the end of life. There may be lots of issues and problems associated with home death. And conversely, uh, we should um, give more value to um, good death in the hospital and, and look at ways in which that can be achieved. So these are some of the wider contexts of um, debate that swirl around this issue and which uh, provide uh, some of the context. Some work has been done to look at how many people in hospital might have palliative care needs. Um, remarkably few studies and not very robust ones. Um, there's a couple of studies from England, but they only involve <coughs> They only involve two hospitals, uh, I think, in the same city. Um, they show that somewhere between a quarter and just over a third of inpatients were identified by staff uh, as having palliative care needs, and 11% were uh, thought suitable for referral to a, a specialist uh, palliative care service. Um, in one Australian hospital network, 35% of inpatients were identified as having palliation as the goal for their long-term care. And uh, in a study in Belgium, uh, 14 hospitals, about 10% of the inpatients were, don't particularly like this term, but that was the language of the paper, were identified as palliative. I think the person's needs are palliative, the person isn't palliative, uh, but were identified as palliative by, by the staff. So some attempts being made in specific hospitals or small groups of hospitals to ask um, what proportion of people uh, with us here uh, at any one time might uh, have palliative care needs uh, and, and these kinds of results uh, uh, appearing. So what we were interested in doing was trying to kind of raise the tempo on that uh, question and look at it, I hope, in a, in a slightly more robust and indeed different way. And um, I have to acknowledge here the role of Eugene Murray, who um, 10 years ago was uh, the chief executive of the Irish Hospice Foundation, which supported the Hospice Friendly Hospitals uh, initiative. And at that time, I, I was a visiting professor um, at University College Dublin and Trinity College Dublin. <coughs> and my involvement there was funded by the Irish Hospice Foundation. So I had a lot of contact with, with the foundation. 
And um, <clears throat> one of the issues that Eugene Murray was interested in was what proportion of people um, who are in hospital might be in the year, last year of life. And um, he put me in contact with somebody that I've still never met and only recently saw a photograph of uh, called Matthew uh, Armstrong at the Information Services Division here in Scotland um, because he, he had talked with Matthew and he thought there might be a way to um, answer this question of what proportion of people um, in hospital are, are nearing the end of life um, using data from Scotland. And what was really important about this idea, which we subsequently picked up on and tried to develop in more detail over the last few years, was that it would give us a population-based approach uh, for a whole jurisdiction, the whole of Scotland, uh, and all of the acute hospitals, the large teaching and general hospitals uh, within Scotland. So it was, wasn't going to be based on a, a sample of a couple of hospitals or, or a dozen or so hospitals in any one place. It would cover the, the whole of the hospital population. And <clears throat> in order to do this, we realized that what was required was uh, the ability to link together um, the hospital records of patients uh, with the death registration records, two quite separate sets of information uh, which would have to be connected to each other. And um, we discovered that in Ireland, this was neither technically possible nor legal. Um, so it wasn't possible to do this study in Ireland. Um, there wasn't the, uh, the te technical infrastructure to link the records, but even if there had been, uh, it wouldn't have been legal to do so for various uh, data protection uh, reasons. Um, so uh, the idea of the study, what came to be called a prevalent cohort study, so it's of a, a cohort of people prevailing in the, in the hospitals at uh, any one time, uh, turned out to be um, that rather rare thing, uh, the first study of its kind in the world. Uh, not almost unique, but unique. Um, so this, this was our study, and we settled on uh, a date in 2010 to uh, examine. And what we were able to do, with terrific help from ISD and Matthew and his colleagues, was to identify the records of every patient who was in hospital in 25 teaching and general hospitals in Scotland, all the big hospitals. So the smaller cottage and community hospitals are excluded, um, one or two special hospitals. Um, so the bulk of the acute hospitals, <coughs> all of the acute hospitals indeed, on the 31st of March 2010 was our kind of sampling point. And uh, we discovered that on that night in hospital there were not a small number of people, 10,743 uh, inpatients in hospital that night. So the, <clears throat> the key then was to link the <clears throat> records of those people um, to the death registration records and, and see where we got, as it were, a, a connection between the two. <clears throat> and what we found when we did that, and I have to confess I don't know how that's done. That's a bit of the black box that I don't understand. You know, things go in and things come out. How it's done in the middle uh, is, a, is a technical process that our colleagues at ISD uh, have mastered. Um, when we did that and made those connections, we, we discovered that 3,098 of the patients uh, had died one year later, and that made up 28.8% of um, all of the patients who were in hospital uh, on that day. And, and we were able to <coughs> track how that 28.8% was made up over seven days, 30 days, three months, six months, nine months. You can see the proportion of people uh, going up over that time. So nearly a third of the people in hospital that night had died one year later. Um, we don't know from this data where they died. That's something we could establish, but we don't know it from this particular study. Um, but what we also uh, did identify was that almost one in 10 of the patients that night, 9.3% uh, of all the patients uh, in hospital, died on that admission. So of the 3,098 patients, um, 
nine points, uh, 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 the, there was a given number of them, 9.3% of all, the, all of the uh, patients in hospital uh, who um, died on the admission we recorded. So they didn't leave the hospital before they had died. So there's kind of two things emerging here. One is that roughly a third of people in hospital are in the last year of life. Uh, but also, and I think this is a significant point, um, almost one in ten of the uh, patients in hospital are going to die before they leave. So we believe that those figures, as you'll see in a while, hold up really quite well and, and probably represent any hospital in our system here in Scotland. So walking into uh, any hospital today, um, you would probably be able to estimate that almost a third of the patients who are in inpatients in that hospital uh, will have died within a year and that nearly 10% of them will die before they leave uh, that hospital. <clears throat> so those are the uh, kind of headline figures uh, from the study. Um, but we, we were able to break this down a bit uh, between men and women and, and in relation to age. and. Uh, I've been very, very pleased as an academic. Uh, you don't do very many. I've published a lot of papers and written books and things. But you don't find many that get read by many more people than your mum and dad and your <laughs> aunties and uncles. Um, I've been delighted, you know, seeing on Twitter and things, uh, to s seeing this slide pop up at conferences like I'm speaking at now. Um, I saw one from Germany just the other day at a meeting on advanced care planning where the sli this slide was being presented in the open, opening plenary. And I think it is a good slide because it gives us the overall uh, uh, sense of the results of the study, but in particular it breaks it down, breaks down these results by gender and by age. Uh, so you can see that for the older men and women, uh, the proportion who uh, uh, are in hospital uh, on any given day in Scotland who will die within a year is much higher than the average for the sample as a whole, the 28%, becomes 54% for the eldest men and 42% for the eldest women. Well, there were one or two people who said, well, isn't that obvious? Uh, older people are more likely to die. But I haven't finished this piece of work because it's separate to the, the study. But um, I do know that, the, that having that risk of death as a, as a man over aged 85 living in the community and the population as a whole of men of that age have a much, much lower rate of death, uh, expectation of death within a year uh, than, than these figures. So, you know, there, this is telling us something about the, uh, the character of the hospital population. It's, just, it's not just reading off, well, older people are more likely to die within a year, aren't they? These are far higher rates of mortality within one year than we would expect to see uh, in the general population of men and women uh, of that age. So this is really a, a key dimension of, of the study, breaking it down into the differences between uh, men and women and into uh, differences by age. So having done that and got a favorable reaction to the study, uh, which I'll talk about in a few moments, um, we, we were pleased, but we always had a kind of nagging doubt. Was there something strange about the 31st of March 2010 the, when we did this uh, particular exercise? Um, was there some quirk or fluke in our data that made it an outlier and not part of a, a kind of general picture? Um, so more recently, uh, we've, we've repeated the study with pretty much uh, the same uh, methods. And we chose a new census date in 2013, so three years on from the original study. Um, we wanted it to be 31st of March 2013, to be exactly like the uh, previous study. Um, but uh, 31st of March 2013 was, in fact, Easter Sunday, so we decided that wasn't a particularly good day to choose. Um, so we've avoided um, uh, weekends and, and bank holidays and gone for a date fairly close. And we found a remarkably similar number of people were in the same group of hospitals uh, on that night three years later, just about exactly the same number, 10,500 people. Um, and when we did that exercise of linking the, the hospital records to the death registration records, uh, we found this time that 29.5% uh, of the cohort had died one year later, as against 28.8% uh, in the first study. 
and that on this occasion 8% of uh, people in hospital died on the index admission as opposed to 9.3%. So the long and short of this um, is that the results of the original study were confirmed. There were no significant differences uh, between the two um, uh, samples, populations. Uh, and when put slightly differently here in a Kaplan-Meier plot where we plotted the survival curve uh, for the two samples, the two populations, in 2010 and 2013, you can see that they're almost identical. So um, this really confirmed for us that the result uh, in 2010 uh, was uh, accurate and, and representative uh, of the, 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 the broader situation uh, in hospitals uh, in Scotland. Um, it's a bit hard to read, uh, but this is the, uh, this is, these are the figures for 2010 and these are the figures for 2013. And uh, I wanted just to highlight um, a couple of things. One of, th one of the things that we were able to do was to look at the specialty, surgical and medical, to which the patients were admitted. Since we published the study, I've had a few people at the university who phoned me up and say, David, I'm going into hospital for a knee operation next week, but I've just read your paper. Should I be worried? Uh, and I said, well, actually, if you're going in for surgery, um, your, 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 your rate of uh, the risk of dying within a year is, is considerably lower. But the, if you look at the medical um, uh, admissions, higher than the average, you know, well over a third of people admitted to medical wards uh, for both samples uh, in both populations in both years uh, have, have died within uh, a year. And, and as I showed earlier, these figures for uh, older people, men and women combined here, uh, significantly uh, consistent across the two periods and at a high level. So. Uh, 45% of uh, the oldest people in 2010 who died within a year and 44% in, in 2013. Um, so we, we believe that this <clears throat> study does give a, a representative picture of the situation uh, in our hospitals and, and forms a, a baseline really for understanding and, and uh, also for discussion. So in comparing the two um, sets of data, we had these two goals in mind. One was verification. Was it a fluke or not? It appears not to have been. Um, was there evidence of change over time? Well, that's something we could continue to do um, uh, going forward. But in this three-year interval, the, there's no evidence of change. It, it, it seems to be a, a fairly settled position that we're in at the moment, that our hospitals <clears throat> on any given day will contain a substantial proportion of inpatients um, that are in the last year of life. And this is the rather simple take-home message of the study. You may say, well, that was pretty obvious, wasn't it? But I think we have established beyond any doubt that what we call the acute hospital is a place that uh, has end-of-life care really rather um, centrally focused in, 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 in its uh, way of uh, uh, in its responsibilities and part of our argument has been that um, we should perhaps think about ways to the seminar as an example um, reflect more actively on on what we've now we've learned from this study and, and what it might mean in terms of clinical focus the allocation of resources i've heard uh, recently and you may have picked it up a growing lobby for uh, not just getting more attention for palliative care uh, getting it into policy documents, getting people better trained and knowing about it. But a growing lobby that's saying that palliative care should be given preference to other areas of the healthcare system in terms of the allocation of resources. This raises quite a lot of questions, obviously. Um, but the, uh, the idea that end-of-life care in the hospital might uh, be a candidate for more resource than it, it currently has would, I, I think, be, to an extent, supported by the data that we have here. So the, the study was um, unusual for me uh, in that when we published it, it, it immediately attracted a, a lot of interest, not just in the social media, in the sort of Twitter sphere, uh, but in the mass media, on the radio, on the television. If there are any researchers in the audience, and uh, you've got a, an interesting finding to publish, um, 
If you can publish it, as we did, just purely by accident, the publication appeared online in the journal um, on UK Budget Day, you may think that's a bad idea, uh, a bad day to publish your findings, but as the BBC said, we need other news as well. And uh, in fact, we benefited from a huge amount of media coverage on Budget Day when, in 2014 when the, uh, when the study was, was published. And as I've said, it's been taken up in uh, policy and clinical literature and wider discussions. Uh, quite a lot of evidence that people are referring to it, uh, seeing it as a tool for advocacy. Um, some of its fans include um, people um, involved in the gold standards framework. They've uh, been very keen to uh, use it because the other metric they've always worked with is 1% of all patients uh, in, uh, of general practitioners die within a year. Well, now they've got this figure for hospitals uh, and uh, are trying to use it in that context and uh, link it to their activities. Um, I think it's a good example uh, of a, a collaborative approach to research. Um, I have to thank the ISD. Uh, the, the original study was done with no funding whatsoever. We, we just did this with goodwill and collaboration. Um, with the, the research team, um, who I'll come on to in a minute, uh, and colleagues in ISD. Um, for the second study, we, uh, ISD had been semi-privatized in the interval, and so we had to pay for their services, and Marie Curie were very helpful in, in supporting us with a fairly modest amount of money that was needed to, uh, to do the data linkage and analysis uh, for the 2013 data. What's also been interesting is that we've now developed um, a three-way collaborative uh, study involving two other countries that have almost the same size population as Scotland, uh, Denmark, and New Zealand. And um, Lena Jalbeck in Denmark um, and uh, Merin Gott in New Zealand uh, are working with us um, and have done the, exactly the same design study uh, on the exact same date as our second cohort, 10th of April 2013. We now have data for everyone in hospital in those three countries on that one night, and we've linked it to the death registrations. I'm, I'm not going to tell you what the results are yet, but uh, they're, they're being worked on at the moment. Um, but there's been a lot of interest in the, in the study internationally, uh, and uh, we hope to, to, to develop it uh, further with, uh, with other collaborators. But we will be publishing the results from Scotland, Denmark, and New Zealand uh, next year, we hope. Um, and then on top of that, and, and to my total surprise, um, there's something that the Times Higher Education uh, weekly newspaper does called the uh, uh, THE uh, <laughs> University Awards, uh, sometimes referred to as the University Oscars. And uh, it's the University of the Year prize and various other things. Well, there's a prize for research project of the year. And to my astonishment, um, uh, this project has been nominated for that prize, one of just uh, five people on five universities on the shortlist. And um, the announcement of uh, the result of the, the, the uh, process will be made on the 26th of November, just in a couple of weeks' time. So we're kind of hoping that uh, we might win that award, not just because it was nice to win it, but I think it would be a great further opportunity for advocacy about this issue, that the, the study demonstrates that uh, we can do more, we can turn more attention to uh, people who in hospital who are in the last year of life and who might benefit fit from uh, more focused uh, interventions. So if we were to win the prize, it would be another opportunity to uh, reiterate the findings and the implications. So finally, just to conclude, um, I've been saying we all along. The, the, the team was an unlikely group of people from uh, myself uh, and colleagues from Dumfries and Galloway. Um, Ananda Allen, uh, Fiona Graham, Andrew Carnan, and Chris Isles. Uh, all from NHS DNG, and I see there are people uh, from NHS Dumfries and Galloway here today. Uh, we worked together with uh, Matthew Armstrong on the first study, uh, and then uh, the second study, uh, we've been able to report it so far in a rapid response um, uh, in the BMJ, uh, hoping to develop it further for another paper. Um, this whole uh, area of uh, inquiry has its own page on our website. If you go to our uh, 
uh, end, Glasgow End of Life Studies uh, website, you, you'll find a, a page uh, where uh, you can get all these details. There are also interviews with people who uh, assess the implications of the study uh, and links to the references uh, and so on. So it's a very simple study. It costs very little to do other than uh, hard work and collaboration between people. Uh, and we believe it's produced an important result, uh, a simple message that we can all take away that on any given day, uh, in the hospitals of Scotland, almost one third of people uh, in patients on that day will have died one year later, and almost one in ten of those patients will die on their current admission. Thank you very much.